Thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible now, if you will, and turn with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And then later on, for those of you who like to be ahead of things, we, we'll be looking at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Daniel chapter 9. And later, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Daniel chapter 9. I want you to look at verse 25. Daniel had been given a vision, a message, if you will, from an angel. And in verse 25 of Daniel 9, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, shall he cause the sacrifice and oblation and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now I call your attention to verse 26, where it says, After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. What we're reading about there are two different beings entirely, the Messiah and the prince that shall come. These are not two titles for the Messiah. These are two different titles, two different individuals. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you that we have the opportunity to come together, to look into your word, to learn from it, and to grow thereby. Lord, help us to focus our attention upon you and upon your word in this hour. Forgive us anything that would stand in the way of your speaking to us and of us receiving exactly what the Spirit would say to the church in this hour. Again, we pray for souls that don't know you, that they would come to trust you, and for those who are saved, that we would be faithful servants of yours. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible contains 66 books. Uh, each one of those 66 books has its own theme. And that's why we have 66 books. However, all of these books harmonize together around some very central themes. And I want to just very quickly give you some of those central themes. Number one, there is a God. The Bible opens with the statement in the beginning, God. There is a God. Number two, God is the creator of the universe and everything in it, including, but certainly not limited to, mankind. Number three, God created mankind in his own image and desires to have mankind relate to him. Number four, God has revealed himself to mankind through his creation and its intricacy, its order and its consistency and the beauty of it. He's revealed himself to mankind through the written word. The Bible itself tells us who God is and what God is like and how man may know him and relate to him. And then the Bible tells us, and, and he's revealed himself through his coming to live with mankind in human form in the person of Jesus Christ. And then it tells us of his continual, God's continual love for mankind. Now, there's more, but those are some of the major themes, four of the major themes of the Bible and that all of the books harmonize around. We also know that mankind has rebelled against God and rejected his revelation of himself and injected their own personality into their view of God. And the rejection of God and his revelation is called sin. And sin separates mankind from God. Now, God doesn't desire us to be separated from him. God desires us to be unified with him. But our sins stand in the way. 
But then we know that God has a plan and a method to restore mankind and the relationship that he desires to have with mankind. And that plan and that method are clearly outlined for us in the scriptures. The books of the Bible are organized by subject matter. They're not always in chronological order. To some degree, they are in chronological order, but not entirely. For example, uh, you may have uh, some of the prophets who are later in the, the books uh, who wrote during the times of the kings, which was in an earlier part of the Old Testament. But let me give you just a, a rundown of how the books are organized. Genesis is the book of beginnings. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy are the books of the law that God gave through Moses to the people of Israel. In those books, we also find the story of God's deliverance of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt and their journey to the promised land, very much a picture of salvation, how God finds us, mankind, lost in the bondage and slavery of sin. We cry out to him. He sends a deliverer. In the case of Israel, Moses, who comes and those who will follow him, those who will put their faith in him, follow him to the promised land. Very much a picture of salvation. Then Joshua through Nehemiah are books of history, and they document how God worked through the lives of the people of Israel in that promised land. And they teach us how God wants to work in our lives, because as you read of these stories of the people of the Old Testament, how God worked with them. That's how God will work with you. It's how he works with people in general. Job, through the Song of Solomon, are books of poetry, but they're more than nice or even beautiful poems. They are books that teach us again how God works in the lives of people, how to sing to God, how to praise God, how to worship God, and they teach us about wisdom and our relationships both with God and our fellow man. Then Isaiah through Malachi are books of prophecy, and this is where God tells us about the future, what he's going to do. Prophecy often has a near fulfillment and a distant fulfillment. We see that in the book of Daniel here. Part of the prophecies in Daniel were fulfilled when Antiochus Epiphanes uh, ruled in the region that we would today call Israel. But part of it has not been fulfilled yet. We'll say more about that when we look at Daniel in just a second here. Then we come to the New Testament. The books, Matthew through John, are the books that teach us. They're called the gospel, the good news. But they are the books that teach us about Jesus. They tell us when, where, and why he came to the earth. They tell us about his time on earth and primarily about his teachings. And they tell us about his substitutionary death upon the cross to pay for our sins. But unlike the biographies of men, and I've read many biographies of men, unlike the biographies of men, the story doesn't end with the death of the main character. He did die. But his resurrection is the hope that we all have of eternal life, of forgiveness, and purpose of living in this life. After his resurrection, he taught on the earth for another 40 days, and then we read about his ascent into heaven and the promise of his return. Then we go to the book of Acts, the one book of history in the New Testament, and it is the story of what happened next. After Jesus was here, he was crucified, buried, rose again, appeared on earth again for another 40 days, ascended into heaven. What happened next? Well, that's what the book of Acts is about. And it's the story of how the apostles followed the Lord's command in taking the great commission or the gospel to the ends of the earth. <clears throat> the books of Romans through Jude are epistles. And that means that they are letters. And these books are written with the preaching and teaching of certain apostles, Paul, Peter, Jude, and John. And then some of them were written to individuals and some of them were written to churches and some of them were written to people at large. Then we have 
the final book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, that is the final prophecy. We're not going to go to Revelation this morning. Lord willing, we'll go there tonight. We'll be looking here in Daniel and we'll be looking in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But many people like to study prophecy. Why? Well, they're interested. They want to know about things to come. They want to know what's going to happen in the future. It certainly seems that we are living in what the Bible calls the last days. It seems like we're in the end times. May I help you with something? When John wrote the Revelation, he thought he was living in the last times. And every generation since then has felt that way. Now, why is that? Because we see things getting progressively worse. There are portions of history where things seem to take a turn back to the right and seem to be turning the way they should be. But then it always seems to go the other way. Instead of progressing, we digress. We go down. We go farther and farther away from God. <clears throat> One of the things that people have heard about and are possibly curious about is the Antichrist. And let me talk to you about that for a second. The word Antichrist can mean two things, and they are not exclusive of each other. They can be combined. But it can be either one who is a false Christ, who claims to be Christ but isn't, or one who is against Christ. Either one could be called Antichrist, a false Christ or one who is against Christ, the opposite of Christ. The word Antichrist only appears four times in your Bible. All of them are in the writings of John, but it carries both those meanings. The meaning of a false Christ, one claiming to be Christ, and one who is against Christ. So I want to see what the Bible says about that. In the last couple of Sundays, we've looked at the return of the Lord Jesus. For the whole month of December, we looked at the first coming of the Lord Jesus. Last couple of Sundays, we've looked at the return of the Lord Jesus. But today, I want to talk to you about the Antichrist or the prince that shall come. We just read Daniel 9, 25 to 27, and in that we have a prophecy of the coming of the Lord Jesus and of the Antichrist. Look at verse 25, if you will. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, the Messiah uh, unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. <clears throat> Jerusalem had been destroyed by the Babylonian army under King Nebuchadnezzar. Five more kings would hold the people of Judah, Judea in captivity until they would be allowed to return to rebuild Jerusalem in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah. That's what the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are about. <clears throat> Excuse me again. From the time that that commandment to rebuild was given until the coming of the Messiah, the prince, it says in verse 25, would be seven weeks and 60 and two weeks or a total of 69 weeks. These weeks are generally accepted as weeks of years. This was telling us about a time of the coming of the Savior of the world. Telling us of when he came. And this prophecy was so well accepted and so precise, that is how the wise men knew when it was time for the Savior to come. They knew it was the right time. They didn't know exactly the day. They didn't know exactly the month. But they knew it would be within about the time of a year that he was coming. And many people in Jesus' time, when Jesus came, also knew the same thing. And many people in Israel were claiming to be the Christ. It's time for the Messiah to come. That's me. I'm here. I'm the Messiah. Why don't we hear about those people? Because most of them got killed very early on. And they did not resurrect. Many of them 
<clears throat> had the goal, and they organized groups of followers to overthrow the Roman domination of Jerusalem in particular and Israel in general. They were none, none of them were successful in doing so. And then they had the final rebellion, after which the Romans came, Roman General Titus came down and destroyed the temple and conquered Jerusalem, they thought, once and for all. From that day to this, that was A.D. 70, from that day to this, there is no temple in Jerusalem. We have the place where it stood, and there's part of a retaining wall for that mountain. They call it the Wailing Wall. There's an arch of a ramp that used to lead up to the temple, but the temple itself is gone. The Romans took it down stone by stone, and they took it apart for various reasons. First of all, they want to destroy the Jews' motivation to rebel against them by taking away their place of worship. They, they thought they would do that. And secondly, there was a great deal of gold between those stones. And they took the gold and took it back to Rome, and more recent archaeological discoveries have told us what they did with it. They used the money to finance the building of the Colosseum in Rome. So it tells us about that in verse 25. When we get to verse 26, it says, After three score and two weeks, or 62 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. And we told you this uh, Sunday or two ago. Anytime in the Bible it talks about somebody being cut off, it means they were killed. They're dead. So it's telling us the Messiah is going to die. But the next phrase is extremely important. Messiah shall be cut off, or shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. He is not dying for himself. He's not dying for a crime that he has done. He's paying for our sins. He's the Savior. The next phrase, though, says, And the people of the prince that shall come, people who are not followers of the Messiah, People who are followers of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary. Did that happen? Yes. We just told you the Roman general Titus destroyed the city and the sanctuary or the temple. Verse 26 goes on to say, And the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the end of the war. Desolations are determined. The end of the war... War is prophesied. Jesus told us that until the end, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And that will continue until his return. Now, there are multiple things meant here in verse 26 that we don't, we don't have time to go through all of them, but let me just give you some of it. It's teaching us that from the time that the commandment was given to rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of Messiah the Prince would be 69 weeks, as we said. And he's telling us about the time the Savior would come to the world. 62 weeks, approximately 434 years. These are works of years. Then Messiah is cut off, not for himself. And the people of the Prince that shall come, in total contrast, total opposite to the Messiah. It's another Prince, but a Prince of a different kind. The people of the prince that shall come, literally the army of the prince that shall come, shall destroy the temple and the city. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. Under the end of the war, desolations are determined. Now, keep that in mind when you, we read verse 27. And he, this is not talking about the Messiah. He, the prince that shall come, shall confirm the covenant, the covenant with many for one week. Now, if we're seeing this as weeks of years, and most Bible scholars are convinced that's exactly what it means, one week is a seven-year period. So this prince that shall come is going to confirm a covenant for seven years. Now, if you're wondering where do we uh, preachers get this idea of a seven-year tribulation period, this is it. 
This is it. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, halfway through, three and a half years in, he shall cause the uh, sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Worship in the temple will cease. Now, it's been noted, and rightly so, that for all of this to happen, the temple that was destroyed in A.D. 70, there has to be a temple in Jerusalem. And I'm going to tell you that this is nothing new. 30 years ago, over 30 years ago now, when I was there, I visited the group I was with, visited the Temple Studies Institute. And this is a group of people in Israel who are ready to rebuild the temple. And they have made their preparations. They've got everything ready to go. They have the plans. They have the materials. They have everything they need. The only thing they lack is the deed to the real estate. What do you mean by that? The Muslims right now occupy the the surface of the Temple Mount where the temple stood before. Somehow, they're going to have to get permission to build the temple there. It is not likely, I cannot say what will or will not happen, but it is not likely that the Muslims are going to just hand that over and let them build there. It's not likely that they will build next to the two mosques that are all already there, although I don't say that couldn't happen. I think it's not likely. But they plan to rebuild, and again, all they need is the deed to real estate. And once they get the permission to build, the earth will be amazed how fast that goes up because all the preparations already been made. It will take very little time to get it built. So during this tribulation time, the temple is standing, but this prince that shall come makes a covenant with the people of Israel For seven years, but three and a half years in, he stops the worship in the temple. What is he going to replace it with? Well, Daniel tells us, let's read verse 27 again. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week shall he cause the sanctuary and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it, the temple, desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. God's judgment is going to come and God's wrath is going to be poured out. And this whole rebellion of mankind is going to come to an end. I want to share with you just a couple other thoughts and then we'll do some page turning. He makes this covenant with Israel And at the halfway point, he does break the covenant. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11 says, And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate, remember that phrase, the abomination that maketh desolate shall be set up. There shall be a thousand three hundred and ninety days, twelve hundred and ninety days or three and a half years. That's Daniel 12, just like it says in in Daniel 9. This happens at the midpoint of that time that we're calling the tribulation period. And this prince that shall come is the Antichrist. Now, we'll show you that later on. So some want to interpret Daniel 9, 27, as we said, as the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, who sacrificed a pig upon the altar in the temple, And it may have a reference to that. I'm not going to say that it has nothing to do with that. It's a good chance there it makes reference to that in a near fulfillment. That, by the way, begins what we call the story of Hanukkah and was celebrated last month. But in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 15, the Lord Jesus referred to an event that was yet future. Now, Antiochus Epiphanes appears hundreds of years 160 years approximately before Jesus came. Can't be talking about him. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet, uh, by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. 
Whoso readeth, let him understand. What is he saying there? He's saying you're going to see the abomination that maketh desolate, mentioned in Daniel 12, 11, and here in Daniel 9, 27. You're going to see that in the future. Not talking about Antiochus Epiphanes. In Revelation chapter 13, verses 14 and 15, we get a pretty good understanding of what the Lord Jesus and Daniel were talking about. It says that the false prophet will set up an image of the beast in the temple in Jerusalem. Listen. And cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Now, this is the prophecy that this image of the prince that shall come or the Antichrist will be set up in the temple halfway through the tribulation period. He makes worship in the temple to stop has his own image installed there, and it is commanded that everybody worship his image. The ultimate of idolatry. Daniel saw the coming of the Messiah, and he saw the coming of the false Messiah, or false Christ, or Antichrist. Now, leave the book of Daniel, if you will, and turn with me over, and I did give you some little heads up on that. Turn with me over to Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians and chapter two. Second Thessalonians and chapter two. The book of Second Thessalonians was written obviously after the book of First Thessalonians. It's letters. They're letters to the church in Thessalonica. Paul had been to Thessalonica. He had spent some time teaching there. And then he wrote the book of 1 Thessalonians. And in the book of 1 Thessalonians, he talks about the return of the Lord. And we looked at that a, a couple of Sundays ago. But he talked about the return of the Lord. Somehow, in the interim, somebody had sent a letter to the church at Thessalonica and signed Paul's name to it. And by the way, let me help you understand that. That was not such an unusual thing. In the period of the New Testament and after, people did many times author documents and sign one of the apostles' name to it. They were fraudulent. They are part of what is called the pseudopigrapha, the false writings. They are not part of the Word of God. That's why you don't find them in their Bible, because the apostles did not write them. Such a letter had been sent to the church at Thessalonica basically telling them that, guys, I know I wrote to you. This is Paul talking. That, that was the claim. It wasn't true. This is Paul talking, and I know I told you the Lord is coming. Well, I, I got bad news for you. He already came, and you missed it. You got left behind. As you can imagine, that caused quite a bit of depression in the church there. So chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians deals with that, and the real Apostle Paul straightens out what happened. Look at verses 1 and 2. He says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Very, very important to understand what he's saying there. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by uh, spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Here's what's happening. First thing he speaks of in verse 1, he says, we beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, I'm telling you, he's still coming. He hasn't come. You haven't missed it. He's still coming. I beseech you by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to plead with you. I beseech you. I want to plead with you in the truth of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and, watch it, by our gathering together unto him. Our gathering together unto him. What is he talking about? Well, we looked at this again before, but back in chapter 4 and verse uh, 13, he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. 
For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus have died believing in Jesus, will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or go ahead of them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. We sang that song a little bit ago, listen for the trumpet. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, caught up, taken out together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what he's talking about in chapter two and verse one, when he talks about our gathering together unto him. So I'm pleading with you in verse one, he says, to listen to me, listen to what I'm teaching. You've received a letter that was wrong. This is the real Paul talking here. And I'm pleading with you, the Lord is still coming and we're still going to be gathered up to him. Verse two, continuing the thought, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. You can imagine they were shaken in mind and troubled. How could the Lord have come and we missed it? And what's going to become of us now? That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit. Don't listen to every spirit. John tells us in First John, try every spirit. Nor by word. Somebody says it nor by letter as from us, even if it looks like a letter from me. If it contradicts what I've told you before, it's not from me. It's not true. As at the day of Christ is at hand, the day of Christ, not speaking of the rapture, but speaking of his coming in judgment. Apparently they thought they had missed the rapture and now the day of judgment was coming and they're left behind to endure that. But great hope is given in verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means, by any means, neither by spirit, by word, or by letter as from us. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? The day of God's judgment shall not come except there come a falling away first. Now, that's an interesting phrase. Many Bible scholars see this falling away as a great apostasy. And indeed, the, the word falling there is the word apostasy. There's no question about that. They see it as a great apostasy, a great turning away from Jesus Christ by his own people. And I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it couldn't mean that. It may very well mean exactly that. I'm not going to say that that isn't going to happen. But the words falling away could also refer to the people of the Lord having gone away and no longer being there. Wasn't that the same thing? Well, it's similar, isn't it? But maybe they've just turned away and they're, they're not following the Lord. In John chapter 6, after Jesus gave his great sermon on the bread of life, near the end of the chapter, it says that from that day forward, many of his disciples turned back and walked no more with him. And Jesus turned to the twelve and said to them, will you also go away? And Peter looked at the Lord and said, Master, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. But many of them didn't follow him anymore after his sermon on the bread of life. That's an apostasy. And that could be exactly what's meant here. Again, I'm not at all saying that. It's not what it's saying. But there seems to be also the idea of people of God just not being there. And I'll tell you why we even have that thought in a moment. But the second thing that has to occur, the first thing that has to occur is this falling away. And the second thing that has to occur before the Lord comes in judgment is the man of sin has to be revealed. The son of perdition. Now, here's two new titles that we get. He's called here the son of perdition. Only one other time is that phrase used in the Bible, son of perdition. 
And it's in John chapter 17, verse 12, when Jesus is praying his high priestly prayer on the night before the crucifixion. And in that verse, John 17, 12, the phrase son of perdition referred to Judas Iscariot, who would betray him that night. He was called the son of perdition. Other than that, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, the only time you'll find that phrase, the son of perdition. That's caused some people to think that this one who is coming is a reincarnation of Judas Iscariot. Let me tell you why I believe that could not be true. First of all, Jewish Judas was a man. Yes, it does say that Satan entered into him. And we read that this one who is coming is Satan incarnate. However, Judas died. Well, it's, it's his reincarnation. I don't believe so. Why? The idea of reincarnation, not just the word, but the idea of reincarnation appears nowhere in the Bible. It is not even spoken against in the Bible. It just isn't there at all. Old Testament, New Testament, you read every word of all 66 books, you will never find any reference to reincarnation. It just isn't there. Reincarnation is an Eastern religious thought, uh, primarily came out of India. It is taught in Hinduism. It is taught in certain sects of Buddhism, uh, but it is nowhere near the Bible. Reincarnation is the idea of a person who lived their life didn't quite get it right. They died. So they get to come back in another form, in another body. Uh, it may be a, another person. It may be an animal. It may, in some cases, be a roach. They, they don't teach that. They do. Where'd you get that? I read the Bhagavad Gita. What is that? That's the book of reincarnation. It's exactly what it says. If you're a filthy person in this life, you may come back as a roach. If you're a gluttonous person, you may come back as a pig. I, I'm not making this up, folks. I'm not. And I'm not making fun. I'm telling you what it says. If you're a good person, you may come back as a human uh, and you get a chance to, to get right until you finally get to where you're supposed to be. And then once you reach that final stage and you die the final time, you go out and you become part of the universe. And that's it. That's it. That's it. No heaven. No. No eternal life. No. You just become part of the universe. You become one with everything. I, I, again, I don't make this up, folks. I'm not. And I'm not making fun. I'm not poking fun at anybody. I'm trying to help you understand this is not talking about Judas Iscariot being reincarnated. That is a totally different idea. It's not what the Bible's talking about at all. Judas went to his own place, which means he went to hell. And the truth of the matter is, nobody has ever come back from hell, nor will they. Fact of the matter is, this is Satan incarnate but in a different human being, and definitely not Judas Iscariot. But both are called the son of perdition. Now, Paul seems to be saying that this great apostasy is going to occur, and then the son of perdition, the son of destruction, literally is what that means. Jesus referred to Satan as he who comes to kill and to destroy the destroyer. So the son of perdition, son of destruction will be revealed. Down through history, many have tried to figure out who this might be. And many have seen candidates, and I think there have been good candidates, good reason to believe that, suspect that certain people might be the Antichrist, but they weren't. Many thought Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist, and you can see why they would think that. There's a book by Dave Hunt called Peace, Prosperity, and the Coming Holocaust. In that book, there's a chapter called Adolf Hitler 
the almost Antichrist. Why do you call him the almost Antichrist? Well, he obviously was not the Antichrist. He was against Christ. But the way he rose to power, Hunt says, is the way that the prince that shall come will rise to power in similar fashion. Then, some said Benito Mussolini had to be the Antichrist. Well, obviously he wasn't. Some people thought that Mikhail Gorbachev was a very likely candidate because he was a world leader and he had a mark on his forehead. Apparently he was not. Uh, there was even talk that Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist because if you took his name, Ronald Wilson Reagan, and you took the numerical value of each letter of his name, it totaled up to 666. Obviously, he was not the Antichrist. Say, so is the Antichrist alive today? I don't know. I have my idea of someone living today who could possibly be that discreet. Well, who is it? I'm not going to tell you because there's no way I can prove it. Absolutely no proof whatsoever. It's pure speculation. But what I want you to know and understand is this one will be a world leader. We'll look more at that tonight. But there's something else you need to see here. Verse 4 tells us about this one, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Did you get that? He comes and he's against everything godly. He's against everything that's good. He's against God himself. He's definitely against Christ. He is anti-Christ. He exalts himself above all that is called God. He's more important than anything that's ever been called God. He's against all this worship, all the worship you've done all you human beings throughout history has been wrong. I am who you should worship. He sits in the temple of God. We already talked about that, the abomination of desolation. He sits in the temple of God and claims that he is God. All of that in verse 4. So Paul says in verse 5, Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things? He had already taught these things. He's bringing them back to mind. Verse 6, And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now that's a very important statement, and we'll come back to that in a second. Verse 7, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. What is that talking about? Well, something or someone holds back the coming of this one until the right time in God's timing he should come. And he tells us the mystery of iniquity is already at work. The work of this person is already in, in place, has been for centuries, millennia, I dare say back to the Garden of Eden. But then something's holding back the full revelation of evil. If God's all-loving and God's all-powerful, how can he allow so much evil in the world? He's holding back evil. Something, someone holding back evil. In verse 7, where it says, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The word let or letteth here means to hold back or to restrain. So let's Read it that way. He who now restrains will restrain until he be taken out of the way. Huh. 1 Corinthians 3.16, New Testament believers are dwelt with the Holy Spirit. It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? New Testament believers are dwelt with the Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit is where today? Listen to 1 Corinthians 3.16 again. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Where is the temple of God today? 
You are the temple of God today if you're a believer in Jesus Christ. He dwells in you. Where there's a greater presence of Christians, where there's a greater presence of Christianity, therefore of a greater presence of Christians, I mean true Christianity, there's a lesser presence of evil. And where there's a lesser presence of Christians, there's a lesser, a greater presence of evil. The Holy Spirit works in and through you and I, and the Holy Spirit holds back evil. Were you saying, preacher, that, that the more people who get saved, the less evil there will be? That's exactly what I'm saying. Let me give you an example of that. It's an old example. Back many years ago in America, uh, we're going back now, and I'm referring back to a period of 100 years ago approximately, give or take a few years. Uh, alcohol was considered public enemy number one. And so the U.S. government prohibited the sale of alcohol, which caused illegal alcohol traffic. And, and that happened. That's always been the argument against it. But preachers, great preachers would go into cities and preach, not for a, a weekend or a week, but for a month and sometimes two and three months at a time. They would build great tabernacles. If you are a country music fan, the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, which is the home of country music and the Grand Old Opry and all that, was originally built for one of these evangelistic meetings. The evangelists, men like Billy Sunday and others, would come to town and they would preach again for a month or two or sometimes as long as three months. And God would begin to work and many people would come to know the Lord and trust him as Savior. You know what would happen? The saloons would get cl closed because they didn't have customers anymore. And there would be the crime rate would go down in those cities because people were getting right with God. And the society was changed because more people were becoming Christians. Now, the more we get away from God and the farther we get away from God, we see a greater presence of evil. But the more godly people there are, the more people that are surrendered to the Holy Spirit, you'll see a lesser presence of evil. He holds back evil. Now, you think it means more than that, preacher? I think it means more than that, but I just gave you a very practical application. So verse 7 again, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Satan's already at work in this world, has been. Only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. That's the Holy Spirit. When is the Holy Spirit going to be taken out of the way? When Jesus comes and calls his people out of this world. When the rapture occurs, then he who now lets or restrains will not be here to let or restrain in the sense that he is today. Then, verse 8, shall that wicked be revealed. When? When the Holy Spirit is taken out of the way. After the rapture, people will know who this prince that shall come is. That's why it's, it's silly for me to tell you who I think it might be. Because for me to do that, I'd have to name somebody who will be living when the rapture occurs, and I can't do that. Because the Lord told us clearly, we do not know when that time is. Be ready. Be ready at all times. Now verse 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That is the day of Christ referred to at the end of verse 2. When the Lord comes... Then shall that wicked be revealed. The rapture will come. The world will know who the Antichrist or the prince that shall come is. And he will have his time of reign. He will reign over the earth for a period. But he is also the one whom the Lord himself shall descend from heaven and destroy with the spirit of his mouth. And with the brightness of his coming, as described in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. In that passage, we'll not take time to go over there today. 
But in that passage, you're going to see that the Lord Jesus is coming and that he has a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. What is it talking about? A sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In Ephesians 6, when we're told to take on the whole armor of God, we're told to take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. What is this sharp two-edged sword proceeding out of his mouth? It is his word. Look again at what it says in verse 8. And when then that wicked, then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with what? The spirit of his mouth. He who literally spoke the worlds into existence, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. All the way through the creation story, God said, and it was so. He who spoke the worlds into existence will speak the beast out of existence. He will judge the world by his word. But that's not all. Verse 8 again. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. He comes with the glory of God. He comes with that brightness, which after Moses had spent time with the Lord and he came down to speak to the people of Israel, they had to put a veil over his face for no one could look at him. His face was glowing with having been in the presence of God. At least twice in the scripture, it talks about angels appearing and it says their countenance was like lightning or as the sun shineth in its strength. Couldn't look upon it because they'd been in the presence of God. He destroys him with the word of his mouth, the sword of his mouth, the sword of the spirit, and the brightness of his coming. Verse 9. Even him, the one destroyed, is even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Don't miss that. He comes, this prince that shall come, comes after the working of Satan means according to the working of Satan with power and signs and lying wonders. Has that ever happened before? It has. Do you remember how God sent Moses to speak to Pharaoh and say, let my people go? Pharaoh would not. And God used Moses to bring miracles to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. Each one of those miracles was a judgment on one of the gods of Egypt. But there were two fellows, Janus and Jambres. They were the magicians of Pharaoh. Now, if you go back and read in Exodus the story of those magicians, it doesn't give their names there. So where do you get their names, preacher? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, they're named. These two magicians were Janus and Jambres. They were magicians of Pharaoh, and they duplicated or seemed to duplicate some of the miracles that Moses did. But there came a point where they couldn't do it. Why? They were not powered, empowered by God. Their working was after the working of Satan, and they had power and signs and lying wonders. I'm going to tell you that I have seen, and, and right in this room, I have seen illusions done that just you just cannot understand. You cannot conceive of how it happened. But it was just that. It was an illusion. What you thought you saw was not what actually happened. Give us an example. I, I, I thought I would. We had a fellow here years ago named Charles Harris, a good friend of mine. And he uh, preached here Sunday through Wednesday. And he said on Sunday he was going to predict Wednesday morning's newspaper headlines. And so... He took a piece of paper, stood right here where I'm standing, and wrote something on a piece of paper. He folded it up, and there was a box brought up here, and he didn't put it in the box. He had somebody else. There were some other men up here on the platform, put it in the box. The other men, he didn't touch it, put a lid on the box, and put padlocks on the box, 
Then they put masking tape over the, the edges and they wrote their initials on it so that if anybody broke the tape, you'd know. Then he gave the box to me. He didn't give it to you. He didn't touch it. He had me take the box and I put it away till Wednesday night. He had no access to that box whatsoever. On Wednesday night, when he came here, just as he said, we put the box up here and he didn't open it. The same men who closed it and sealed it, opened it and took it out and took out the piece of paper. And he stood over here with the Wednesday morning's newspaper. And what was on the paper in the box was the same as Wednesday morning's newspaper headlines. I asked him later, I said, how did you do that? He said, and listen carefully to what he said. Now I'm going to use his words. He said, I'm not going to tell you. He said, but if I did tell you, you'd look at me and say, you sneaky dog. It's an illusion. It wasn't real. It's an amazing illusion, but it was an illusion. Do you understand what I'm saying? So Satan can imitate the works of God, but they aren't the works of God. Satan does not have the power of God. Don't misunderstand me. Satan has power, but he does not have the power of God. That's why Janice and Jambres could imitate up to a point, and then they couldn't go any farther. Verse 11, I'm sorry, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who what? Believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here's what he's saying. The prince that shall come comes with all deceivableness and unrighteousness. And the people, them that perish, are condemned forever. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth. What is the love of the truth? John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. They would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Same gospel for everybody. And everyone who believes is saved. So for this cause, because they rejected Christ, because they rejected the truth, because they rejected salvation, God sends them strong delusion, a mental straying off, uh, unable to find the way, being lost. Again, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The result of that is that they should believe a lie, or literally the lie, that the prince that shall come will save them. Because they have rejected the Lord Christ, they will receive the Antichrist. And what verse 12 is saying is that they will be damned, condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, John 3.18, who believe not the truth, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man comes unto the Father but by me, John 14.6, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. They choose the pleasure of sin for a season over the forgiveness of Christ and eternal life forever. So Paul tells us the mystery of iniquity doth already work. John writes and says, Every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist whereof you have heard that it should come and even now is in the world. You're of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, 1 John 4, 3 and 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4 through 6 speaks of the Lord Jesus, Emmanuel, the Christ, our Savior. And he says, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. John chapter 11, I'm sorry, chapter 1, John chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. So the big question is, have you received him? If you have, then praise God. Praise God. If you have not, the question is, will you? Preacher, do you think it's too late? It's not. It's not too late. According to all that we've read today and all that we've seen today, it is not too late. You can still trust the Lord and be saved. So will you? Will you pray and will you trust him? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us. Thank you for the time that we've had together here today. Thank you for your word, so clear and so plain. Thank you for Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. And now, Lord, I pray that each person hearing us today would take a moment to examine their own heart and their own life and to believe and understand that Jesus is the way the truth, and the life. There's no other way to come to the Father but by him. One mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. I'm going to interrupt my prayer and talk to you folks, heads bowed, eyes closed. Again, if you've already trusted the Lord as your Savior, you do not need to do that again. But if you haven't, or if you're not sure about it, we want to help you today. We want you to come. Let us take a Bible. Let us show you how to be saved. You'll do that, won't you? Maybe you're here today and you're listening electronically or you're in your seat and say, well, I, I don't know exactly what it's all about. Sounds good to me. I'm not sure what it's all about. Well, that's what we want you to do. Come and let us show you what it's all about. Take a Bible and show you what the Word of God has to say that you might be saved. If you've already trusted the Lord as your Savior, you do not need to do that again. But if you have not, and you would like to, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. As we do, we invite you to come. Let us help you. It may be that everybody listening today has already trusted Jesus as Savior. And I'm going to say it one more time. You do not need to do that over. But if there's anyone listening who is uncertain, I invite you to pray with me now. And pray and say, Lord Jesus, I believe. I believe that you love me. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you paid for my sins at the cross. I believe that you're alive today and I trust you as my living Savior to forgive me, to save me, to give me everlasting life, a home in heaven with you forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And maybe you prayed that prayer with me, maybe you didn't. You still have a question about it, I want you to come. We're going to sing a hymn. I'm going to leave the platform. If the Lord has spoken to you, you come. Father, bless and move this invitation time. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.